Please pray with me. O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of each heart be acceptable in your sight. Lord, you who are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Well, this morning's readings led me to think about a particular motto, be prepared. Anybody here, especially our young ones, know where that motto comes from? A couple of people here. Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts, that's right. That is the Boy Scouts of America motto as well as the Girl Scouts. Its founder, Baden-Powell, Robert Baden-Powell, explains its very intentional meaning as you are always in a state of readiness in mind and body to do your duty. He further explained when people ask them that scouting prepares young people for life. In life, we must be ready for the challenges and I would assume opportunities as well that come our way. In the Boy Scout handbook, it reads, Baden-Powell's idea was that scouts should prepare themselves to become productive citizens and strong leaders and to bring joy to other people. He wanted each scout to be ready in mind and body and to meet with a strong heart whatever challenges came, came his way or await him. Similar to the Boy Scout motto, and I think very appropriate for this Veterans Day weekend, is the motto of the United States Coast Guard. Yes, an actual branch of the military that often gets forgotten. But uh, the United States Coast Guard motto is Semper Paratus, which is the Latin for always prepared. Now, historically, there's not really any documentation on how that motto came to be, except about uh, 1910, it showed up on the Commandant's letterhead, and it stuck. And so 12 years later, uh, Captain Francis Saltus van Boskirk in 1922, wrote the songs to the Coast Guard hymn, and it was entitled, Always Prepared, and those words are in the song. And his hope was that it would be just as prominent as the Marine Corps, um, Always Faithful, and the um, Navy motto, Anchors Away. And apparently he achieved that goal. Um, and I think it's a very appropriate uh, motto for the Coast Guard because uh, as I was researching the, their motto, I also came to learn the vast list of things that the Coast Guard does. Um, they are responsible for search and rescue, and they take care of our ports and waterways and coastal security for drug interdiction, migrant interdiction, living marine resources, marine environmental protection, ice operations. In other words, since the Titanic, they now map where all the icebergs are and so that we know where they are and they break up ice if it's going to be a problem for the ships that need to go by. Um, marine safety, aids to navigation, other law enforcement, and defense readiness. Those are all parts of being a Coast Guard and there's only 40,000 of them. It's a very small branch, but that's a lot of work. They have to be ready for a lot of things. And so do we, don't we? It's probably not hard to figure out why I'm telling you about always being prepared today, because today's gospel is about ten maidens who go to await the bridegroom to escort him into a wedding. And while five of them come fully prepared and beyond for his arrival, the other five do not. It's not that they didn't come prepared with their lamps and things to trim the wick with, um, and their lamps had oil in them. But what they didn't prepare for was a delay. They all arrived at the appointed time with what they were supposed to have, completely ready to go, but the bridegroom was delayed. I think it's also important, and it'll become important in a minute when we talk about it, but they, they get to sleep while they're waiting. But when they awake at the sound that he's arriving, the women who didn't bring extra oil find that they're limited because they didn't bring extra oil, while the other five have. And so they're able to light their lamps. It's enough for them. But it's not enough to share. And it's not that they weren't being selfish in sharing, but they just knew that the amount of oil they brought was what they needed to keep their lamps lit. And if they shared, they would all go out, and that would ruin the celebration. They came prepared for more than just the task at hand or the regular ritual, but they came in a way that put them a step ahead. They came prepared for a step beyond. Now, this parable has often been used to teach people that if they don't perform certain works, 
If they're not prepared, they won't enter the kingdom of heaven, which is a highly metaphorical reading of this text. I think, though, that we miss the real point when we focus on what happens instead of talking about why it happens. In other words, the middle of the story. In our Lutheran understanding of God's grace, we profess that it is not our works that bring us our salvation, but only grace alone from God that brings us salvation. These words are written over and over and over in the New Testament. We read a lot of them in Romans this fall. Earlier, we had a lot of readings from Romans, and that's where Martin Luther really understood his uh, final uh, grace alone by faith alone uh, theology. So therefore, if we believe that it's God's grace alone that saves us through the faith that we're given and empowered by it with the Holy Spirit at our baptism, then we can't believe these maidens were thrown into the pit where there was weeping and gnashing of teeth because they weren't prepared. In fact, Matthew makes no mistake to include weeping and gnashing of teeth in several other passages that I've preached on this year. But in this particular story, this isn't the point that he makes. In this story, the maidens miss the wedding banquet, the celebration. So what can we take from this if we don't focus on the end of the story but the middle and its meaning? What for us as Christians does it mean to be prepared or to claim that we're always prepared? I think that this is where Dietrich Bonhoeffer's concepts of cheap grace versus costly grace that he writes about in his book Discipleship come into play. Bonhoeffer explains that cheap grace is to acknowledge that God has saved us through grace, but not take it any further, not take it that extra step, not let those words and that gift change our life or our actions. We recognize that we're saved by grace, so there's really nothing required of us, so we don't put any effort into living any particular way. But in living this way, we cheapen the cost of grace, which was Christ's death. We take away all gratitude of this incredibly powerful and sacrificial gift that we've been given, and we almost just toss it aside just to continue living on to our old inner self, our old Adam, if you will. On the other hand, costly grace not only acknowledges the sacrificial and perfectly holy gift of God's grace and mercy and forgiveness, but it goes an extra step, like the extra oil. The person who acknowledges the costliness of grace is so thankful for that gift that they live out their lives in gratitude as changed disciples of God. Costly grace transforms people in their works or their actions, the ways that they seek to serve God and neighbor. And their emphasis is foremost on their mind as they live out their days and their nights. Amos, the prophet, that we heard earlier, writes about cheap grace, so to speak, in, a way, in his own way, in his own time, even before Christ came. Amos, much like Micah, was sent to warn the people about their going through the motions and their following the rituals without really any intention of their lives being changed. They were doing the things that they're supposed to do, but it wasn't the same as performing those things with their heart behind it. The wealthy could atone for their sins all day long because they had all these resources. They could continue to do whatever they wanted in life, and then what for them was a very minimal sacrifice they could take to make up for it. But if you think about what sacrifice was meant in God's rules for the people of Israel, it was really meant to be something that takes a little bit away, that something that we that we miss, something that we give up meaningfully in reparation for our actions. So Amos would argue that many wealthy leaders were getting away with these little sacrifices and just going through the motions, and these things didn't really serve to transform their lives. But often the poor, who could not afford to atone for their wrongdoings, were suffering not only from earthly poverty, but from spiritual poverty as well, as they tried so hard to live rightly because they could not afford these sacrifices. So when they did mess up, they felt like they couldn't get right with God just didn't seem fair. So Amos reminds the people to let justice roll like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. These are the things that continue on, that are ever-moving, ever-moving, that engulf our lives every day with serving God and serving neighbor. And that comes from the intention 
of our hearts. So then how does an understanding of costly grace, one that transform our living, help us to be prepared? One could argue that this means we must always be working and always preparing, but our gospel would argue no. Even in their time, the women who were coming to meet the bridegroom took time to sleep and to rest. The point of the story wasn't to always be working and always going, but it's to look beyond our required actions for what may lie ahead and to always be ready to serve. And part of preparation is practice, just like in our, we talked about in our children's sermon. You may have heard the phrase, even I practice Christianity. It used to be a, a question that people would be asked, what religion do you practice? And my answer would be Christianity. Someone else might answer something else. And I, I know that we don't hear that as often as we used to, but it was a nod to the lifestyle that a Christian led where we actually practiced our faith or lived it out. In other words, practice calls us to action because you can't learn to play piano without playing piano. You can't learn to swim without swimming. You can't uh, learn how to be kind to someone without practicing being kind. And likewise, we can't fully understand and live out our faith unless we actually live out our faith and practice that. And these actions aren't to save us, but they're to keep us prepared, to help us continue to learn and grow and be attentive and look beyond and to serve our neighbor and to live in a manner of gratitude. Practice indicates that we won't always get it right. Practice makes perfect, yet we know that we aren't perfect until that final day when Christ comes again. So this is why grace is all the more important, and it's really cause for thankfulness, because we can't always practice correctly. So let's go back to Robert Baden-Powell for a minute and reread his statement. Baden-Powell's idea was that the scouts should prepare themselves to become productive citizens and strong leaders and to bring joy to other people. He wanted each scout to be ready in mind and body, to meet with a strong heart, whatever challenges await him. Being prepared means that we are productive and strong leaders that bring joy to others. And being prepared is not only about our body, but about our mind and our soul. Trusting that God is with us so that our hearts can be strong to withstand all of the challenges and opportunities that come our way. Our faith will stand strong against the biggest storm when we are prepared. And we will also enjoy the celebration with God that costly grace has brought us. Amen.